Hello, what's up? Hey, y'all, how you doing? Welcome to CNN 10, your 10 minutes of news where I simply tell you the what, letting you decide what to think. I'm Coy Wire, starting today with a quote for some Motivation Monday. Amelia Earhart, the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean, said, the most difficult thing is the decision to act. The rest is merely tenacity. So here's to being tenacious and let's get this show on the road. We start today with space junk, objects hurtling a few hundred miles above Earth, 10 times faster than a bullet. Anything man-made that's left in space can be space junk when it's no longer in use. It can be anything from whole satellites that aren't working anymore to something as small as a fleck of paint. And even that tiny fleck of paint can be a big concern orbiting the Earth at super high speeds, posing a threat to manned and unmanned spacecraft. Now, the long-term impact of not only these space junk fragments, but also fossil fuel emissions in space is unknown, but something scientists are studying. Because as for-profit companies compete in the race to explore space, they're adding tons of new fossil fuel emissions and potential debris with every launch. Science is showing that it's changing the sky in really measurable ways, bringing with it potentially harmful consequences for the ozone layer and Earth's climate. All of this is creating a sustainability issue in space that some are on a mission to solve. CNN's Anna Stewart has a look at how one company hopes to create an infrastructure for capturing and recycling the space junk that's cluttering our orbit. 170 million pieces of space junk flying around the Earth at speeds nearly seven times faster than a bullet. Some as small as bits of paint, others parts of once working satellites now dead. Typically satellites, if they run out of fuel or something happens to it where it's just not working, it is essentially orbiting around the Earth dead. As objects collide in space or quit functioning, the more crowded the area becomes. And the more debris, the higher the risk to other objects in orbit. But an Italian firm called D-Orbit hopes to decrease this risk and overcrowding with a vehicle specially made for relocations, cleanup and repairs. With a $130 million contract from the European Space Agency, the company plans to use their device on satellites in geostationary orbit. That's when a satellite remains over one specific part of the planet's surface and orbits at the same rate as the Earth rotates, giving the illusion on the ground that it isn't moving. Once one becomes unusable, that's when the GEA comes in. The type of interface that we invented, it's already uh, suitable for any type of satellite in GEA. So we are going to approach the satellite target, the customer satellite, we dock with the satellite, and then at that point we can extend the life of the satellite, move the satellite in other locations in order to serve other markets. The GEA can also send objects at the end of their life to so-called graveyard orbits, around 100 kilometers higher than geostationary orbits and further away from operational satellites. This vehicle can also guide items toward Earth so they can burn as they enter the atmosphere. If GEA works, there will be fewer dead satellites flying aimlessly around the Earth and a more sustainable way to reduce and recycle them making way for a safer, less crowded space and more room to explore the universe. Pop quiz hot shot. What state experienced the largest earthquake on record in US history? California, Hawaii, Alaska, or Washington? Answer is Alaska, where a magnitude 9.2 earthquake struck Prince William Sound on March 28th 1964. While Alaska has seen the biggest earthquake in U.S. history, the state of California is no stranger to major seismic activity. California is home to many faults that can produce powerful earthquakes, and recent activity has left folks there literally and figuratively shook. Two quakes rocked cities in Southern California in August and September, Thankfully, not inflicting major damage, but strong enough to rattle some nerves. It's left folks there wondering if a big one is coming. CNN's Stephanie Elam gives us an inside look at how scientists are keeping an eye on those faults and how we can be better prepared for earthquakes in the future. All of the greater Los Angeles region is just laced with active faults. <laughs> Los Angeles is known for its earthquakes. 
Active fault lines are at work across the region, right underneath our feet, creating the topography that we see. These fault lines form where rocks or plates push against one another, displacing the Earth's crust. The notorious San Andreas is California's largest and most famous fault. The plates are always moving. So every day we go about our lives and slowly, inexorably, the plates just keep moving a little bit every day. And as they do that, they're accumulating energy that needs to be released in large earthquakes. Los Angeles has not faced a large tremor since 1994, when a 6.7 magnitude earthquake struck near the neighborhood of Northridge. The county's population has grown since then, welcoming more than one million additional residents who live above the fault lines. This year, a 4.4 magnitude quake hit Pasadena in mid-August, followed a month later by a 4.7 magnitude event near Malibu. The earth is just letting off a little steam, and the magnitude fours that we've had lately in the Los Angeles area are uh, pretty amazing in a way. They let us understand what it feels like to have an uh, earthquake and that ground shaking that so many people felt. But they're quite small compared to the large earthquake that actually needs to happen to release all the energy that's been building up. This series of recent activity leaves some Californians wondering, is a life-changing earthquake just around the corner? CNN reached out to multiple seismologists who agreed. They aren't expecting the big one, but a big earthquake is guaranteed. Scientists just aren't capable of pinpointing exactly when. It's a cycle that started long before humans populated the area and one that will continue long after we're gone. We do not predict earthquakes. <laughs> we, part of the reason is that uh, in order to have a robust society, we need to plan for them. So uh, by having a 30-year window that we say, well, your odds are, say, 30% in the next 30 years for a particular fault, for example, by doing that, we can design buildings, infrastructure that can actually withstand that earthquake when it does finally happen. If you think about preparedness, water is the first thing we all need, food, medical supplies for your family, uh, take care of your pets <laughs> also, um, and communicate with your neighbors about how you could share. Today's story getting a 10 out of 10. We might need our magnifying glass to peep this one. It's a Rubik's Cube so small, you need tweezers to solve it. After four years in the making, Japanese toy maker Mega House unveiled the tiny version of the classic cube CNN's Hanako Montgomery shows us how the company was able to make this itty bitty puzzle and how big its price tag is. This is what it takes to solve the world's smallest Rubik's Cube. You'll need a lot of patience and a pair of tweezers. It's about the size of a few grains of rice, with each side measuring just five millimeters. But yes, it actually works. It's made with such delicate parts that if you shake it roughly like you would with a normal Rubik's Cube, there's a possibility that parts might come off. The world's smallest Rubik's Cube was designed by Japanese toy maker Mega House. Made of aluminum, it's about a thousand times smaller than the classic version. I wanted to show the world the beauty of Japanese miniatures, the technology that is packed into these small things. But assembling them is the trickiest part because it has to be rotatable. If you make it too tight, with no gaps, it won't move. So you need a minimum amount of space. You need a lot of concentration to do this. Okay, then the good eyes. At over $5,000, this tiny cube is more of a collector's item, with deliveries rolling out from April. All right, before we say adios, we are showing some love today. Our shout out goes to the Sharks at South Portland Middle School in Portland, Maine. Rise up. Thanks to all of you for subscribing and commenting on our CNN 10 YouTube channel for your shout out requests. Have an awesome day, everyone. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. I'm Koi Wire. We are CNN 10.